words in the room. Yes. Yes. Yeah, no, definitely. I was saying to the rosemary. Is it? Yeah. It comes on the Friday. It comes on Friday the 13th. I'd suggest it's a rosemary. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Hello, click microphone. Hello. Testing one, two, three on the handheld. Is that Bing from your? That Bing was from your laptop, wasn't it? That Bing. There was a Bing. Was there? You didn't hear it. Yeah, okay. no, I didn't. Um, Quarter past twelve. Yeah, and lunch is at twelve thirty, I believe. Yeah, it should be ten past. Ten past. Yeah. Well, yeah. If you think ten past, quarter past. I think it's just said she's going to finish at midday. Right. So. Well, just to check her with that. Um, but I know we've yes, definitely booked so it for twelve thirty. Yeah, I don't think. Don't so she should have put it for twelve ten. Is what we agreed on Friday. Going to move it forward a bit. Yeah, that's the latest printer. Oh, sorry, you got them. Yeah, she said the times that we've put the food is earlier than these times because if, if they need to put it out when the things finish, if we're yeah. earlier until then it doesn't work. So. Okay, so the lunch should have been twelve ten. Should be twelve ten. Okay, I'll check. And if you maybe just see where they are at midday. Yeah. Is that muted? Is yeah, that's so fine. Muted. That's fine. Muted after, after the video. Wait, there shouldn't be any more. Yeah. There shouldn't be any more. I can imagine the healthy stages of things might be interesting. Yeah. I'll put, I'll this, is all, this is all I running think. and streaming at the moment. Right? Cool. So both of these, will, both of these are running. They're just live. And they're tested, so it all should be good. Well, I did a slide.
was like you mean always do that you mean there. And uh and it should work. Nothing could possibly go like this.
This is the limit. So if you stand off the limit, so it's either it's either here or there. Everybody. Yes. We're just about to start. Um, just going to see if there's anybody outside that we need to ask to join us in the room. So I'd like to welcome uh, all the journalists that have joined us today for this press conference for the official 
launch of the International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration. I'd also like to welcome journalists who have joined us for the live stream online in the UK, overseas and in the US. Sorry it's very early for you. I uh, hope you've got a coffee with you. I'd just like to run through what we're going to do today. Um, I'm Athena Dina. I work in the communications team at British Antarctic Survey and I'm working as part of the science um, coordination office for this programme. I'm very excited about that. I think this is a fantastic program for the next five years to really understand what's happening to West Antarctica. I'm going to hand over for a welcome for, from Professor Duncan Wingham, who's the Executive Chair of NERC and the UK Research and Innovation. We're then going to unveil a new short film about Thwaites that explains why Thwaites, why now, why is it important. And then we have a message from Scott Borg from NSF, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today. I'm then going to hand over to Professor David Vaughan from British Antarctic Survey and Dr Ted Scambos from the National Snow and I Ice Data Centre, who are going to give an overview of the eight projects that comprise this programme. And then we're going to ask all the principal investigators from the UK and the US, 17 of them are here today for this meeting, to sit at the front um, and we can take questions from journalists in the room but also um, via email from those of you who are joining us for the live stream. Now, we're not expecting any fire alarms this morning, but there will be a test at around noon. So I'm hoping that we'll be finished by around noon, but just in case you hear a fire alarm, it's a test. Don't panic. You don't need to leave the room. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Professor Duncan Wingham. So thank you very much, and um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here. Um, on behalf of NERC and our new parent organization, UKRI, and a particularly warm welcome to our colleagues from, from the US who've made the trip across the Atlantic uh, to be here today. Um, it's actually, uh, it is actually, this year is the 20th anniversary, actually, of the discovery of the drawdown of the Amazon, cent Amazon sector um, ice streams. Uh, and interestingly enough, that, 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 that discovery was also a, a UK-US discovery, uh, but it wasn't made by glaciologists. Th those of us who were involved at the time would be more accurately described as geodesists. And uh, our principal weapon in those days was satellites. We, we have, uh, in the intervening 20 years, learned a lot uh, about what's happening in, in Antarctica. And we have learned not only that the drawdown is happening, um, but we have also learned that, at least in the case of the Pine Island Glacier, the, the driver of this change isn't the ice sheet itself, but uh, appears to lie, lie in the ocean. Nonetheless, uh, it, is, it was always going to be true that at some point to understand what was really happening in the Amazon sector and Thwaites in particular, uh, it was, we would need, to, would need to go and find out what actually was happening in the stream and uh, probably more important, uh, what was happening underneath it. And uh, in order to do that, uh, one realises pretty quickly that one has a very considerable challenge uh, and that to answer that challenge first of all one, one needs to bring one's heavy artillery to bear both scientific and uh, artillery but also probably more importantly um, logistic artillery because uh, Thwaites in particular is probably one of the least hospitable parts of the Antarctic continent and happens to be furthest away from any of any of the permanent bases. And when we looked at this uh, some years ago now, uh, it seemed almost obvious too that it, that it was an international challenge. That it, it, this was not something that was within the grasp of any uh, individual nation. Also, even a casual look at the map shows that this base, this uh, stream is approximately half, exactly halfway actually, between the UK and the US bases, and that immediately tells you what the basis of the international collaboration should be. It is about, I think from memory it's about three years ago, and I've just had that confirmed, 
that I attended a meeting uh, in Washington, uh, which was a very, very positive meeting, and one where within a very short space of time, we identified that were we to bring together the combined forces of the UK and the US to this problem of Antarctic glaciology, we, we could, as it were, bring it within reach. And uh, there's been, of course, a lot of work that has happened in the last three years to bring, bring us here to, to the start, what I would describe as the starting line. And I would like to offer my thanks to all of the people, both over in the US and here, who've put a lot of effort in in the intervening time uh, to bring, bring this uh, all together. So the, the, the risk of significant sea level rise from the Amazon sector and, and Thwaites in particular it is a very real one. And although it's certainly true today that there are other sources of sea level rise which are larger than that of Antarctica, it is also true that no other source of water has the sheer volume and capacity that is present on the continent. We can't today predict what's going to happen in Thwaites. We can only we only know enough today to know first of all that there is deflation going on. Secondly, that there is of the order of a meter or so of water stacked up behind, and that there are reasons to suppose that a retreat once started would be irreversible. And Thwaites, of all the streams, is not only the largest, but the one that looks uh, geometrically speaking the most exposed to an ongoing retreat. I think both as science funders and as scientists, we, we do have a responsibility to uh, be able to advise the wider world of uh, what, what is the most likely scenario uh, and or how ignorant we are about the future. I, I do hope that this initiative um, will come to be seen uh, in its way as, as uh, another important milestone in understanding what is happening in the Antarctic continent. And uh, I would like to wish all of you who are here as leaders of the various components of this both the best of luck in achieving your ambition but also underline your responsibilities now uh, to give us that source of understanding and knowledge that we don't have today. So with that, I'll finish and uh, look forward to the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Thanks for that, Duncan. Um, and we're now going to show you the new film that NERC um, has made for this collaboration. Thwaites Glacier is located in a really remote part of Antarctica. You know, Antarctica is already difficult to get to, already a difficult place to put people in the field doing science. But this particular area is sort of at the limit of both the U.S. resources from one side and the British resources from another. It's going to take both nations' uh, capabilities in Antarctica in order to set all of these studies out on the ice. in Antarctica now for almost 30 years and I've worked in West Antarctica for much of that time. This is the first opportunity that we've had to visit Thwaites Glacier and mount the scale of scientific program that will actually give us the answers that we need to reducing that uncertainty around sea level rise.
you enjoyed that presentation. Sorry, it was a bit loud. Just wanted to make sure everybody could hear. <laughs> so we've now. It's my great pleasure to be a part of this important announcement by the International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration. I only regret that I can't be there in person to share the excitement. Even so, the National Science Foundation and the U.S. Antarctic Program are ably represented by Paul Cutler, Jesse Crane, and others. Today's announcement is critically important to all of us, no matter where we live, because as we have learned, what happens in the Antarctic doesn't stay in the Antarctic. Thwaites Glacier has the potential to affect sea level worldwide, possibly leading to changes in global ocean circulation. We know this enormous glacier covering an area larger than Florida already contributes to sea level rise. What we don't know is how quickly that contribution may grow over time, or whether we have decades or centuries to prepare for the effects. Some people might say that this field work is too expensive. I would counter that humanity cannot afford to wait. The fate of our coastal cities and our economy are at stake. This jointly supported research represents international cooperation at its best. In keeping with the vision of the Antarctic Treaty, no one nation could possibly support the intensity of research envisioned by this project. And no one nation has to. Britain and the United States are leading the way with welcome participation from several other treaty nations. Thanks to diplomacy and to advances in technology and international scientific cooperation, we are proud and excited to launch this undertaking at an unprecedented scale. On the ice, under it, in the air, and on the ocean. Today we look to the future, to the future of this project, which we expect to yield unprecedented understanding of this critical part of Antarctica. To the future of those who are part of this endeavor, especially those young scientists just venturing into the field who will live in a world that may be different from the one we know today. And to a future where science continues to unlock the mysteries of the natural world in one of the most inhospitable and remote places on Earth. It's been my privilege to have been a part of the international discussions that brought this endeavor to fruition. We at NSF join many others, both within the science community and the public at large, in anticipating the insights and advances it will produce. We now pass the torch to the scientists, the students, logistics experts, and support providers to complete the work. On behalf of the National Science Foundation, we wish you all the best. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to Professor David Vaughan and Ted Scambos, who are going to give an outline of um, of the program and the eight projects. Can I just say to any journalists who have joined us via the live link, if you have any questions, please email them to press at bass.ac.uk and we will answer those in the Q&A session afterwards. Thanks. Good morning. Um, I'm David Vaughan. I'm Director of Science here at Bass. Um, but I'm in this project, I'm one of the participants in the Science Coordination Office. Ted Scambos, who will be following me, is the other main person in that uh, Science Coordination Office. And our role is to really try and bind these eight projects, scientific projects, together to maximise the scientific value that this programme is going to produce. Um, I've been asked today to give a, an overview of the scientific project with, with Ted, um, and we're going to do that. But one of the things I should emphasize from the outset is we're not going to be able to delve too deeply into the individual projects that are going to deliver the science in this regard and you'll have an opportunity to talk to the principal investigators for those projects um, after we've given our overview. As I said in that video clip this is actually something I've been looking forward to essentially now for many decades of my scientific life having worked in ice sheet research and in these broad questions of sea level rise for so long. This is a real ambition, I think, for myself and Ted to see this programme come together and see the spirit of cooperation that's actually been demonstrated already this morning. Um, I'm allowed to show this slide, but only briefly. 
because of the, the, the difference in precedence of the flags apparently shown here. This is, I should stress, a completely equal and um, um, uh, a cooperative program. And it does build on a very good track record that we have in the UK working with the US and the US working with the UK. We are very good on the ice together and uh, we hope strongly that other nations are going to become involved. Just the background, why are we doing this program? The program is here to help us reduce uncertainty in future projections of sea level rise. This is the IPCC's last um, summary slide on sea level projections and you can see that as we go into the future those two funnels that represent different carbon futures both have enormous uncertainty attached. Indeed the IPCC added this caveat, this codicil on the bottom that said explicitly if the marine sectors of our ice sheets, and largely that means West Antarctica and Thwaites Glacier prominently within that, were to enter a period of collapse, then even these projections could be too, too low. And really the whole program is about understanding that extra uncertainty attached to sea level rise and doing what we can to remove it, allowing people to protect their coastal environments and to prepare properly to protect their uh, populations. Here are four, no better reason than that I could find fo good photographs of them, four examples of completely diverse and different approaches to protecting against coastal flooding, sea defence, um, in Venice, in London, up, uh, downstream of Rotterdam, and of course in New Orleans. These projects, each of them represents billions of pounds, dollars, euros expended on sea defence um, and protecting the, the inland areas. These are just four examples, and in fact there are coastal cities, coastal ecosystems around the world that are threatened by sea, uh, by sea level rise and the f increased frequency of storm surges that would occur uh, with that sea level rise. This is what Thwaites is actually all about. We'll tend to focus on what's going on in the Antarctic, but actually the whole reason for us doing it is this kind of, um, uh, to reduce that uncertainty. The programme, as Duncan Wingham said, has come out of some long period of refining the ideas of why we are uh, going to Thwaites Glacier and why and, and the program attached to it. The, this process really began with the National Academies of Sciences um, uh, review in 2015 of what were the priorities for Antarctic research and marine ice sheet instability. Thwaites Glacier actually came out as the highest priority um, for that research. A f meeting in the Royal Society in London demonstrated a real commitment between the US and the UK science communities to collaborate on this project, which is bigger than any one of us. And then the scientific questions that we should be addressing was uh, developed in this community paper, which was published uh, early last year. So there has been a long preparation, not only to secure the funding, but also to refine the questions that we will be dealing with. The projects that you will meet here today, or at least meet the PIs, are um, ones that have gone through a very uh, strict review process involving over 100 external reviewers who have looked at their projects and selected the very ve best projects to be part of this programme. I'm going to hand over to Ted Scambos now to take you through some of the scientific background around the ice sheets. Hi everyone. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about the scientific uh, underpinnings, why we came to conclude that Thwaites was uh, perhaps the most uh, important glacier that we could study. And uh, uh, some of the uh, projects also that have been funded. We'll do a quick overview of how they're integrated together, what they're going to try to study individually, and uh, how they're going to address the prob problem as a group. 
So Thwaites, as you might be able to see here, is this very large, uh, wide glacier that reaches into the heart of West Antarctica. So right away, geographically, it gets your attention because we know that the West Antarctic has already been showing signs of instability and could indeed have been uh, open seaway uh, with ice on the ocean uh, in the past. As Duncan introduced, this area has been recognized for a long time from satellites as being an area that was basically shouting at us that it's an important one. If you look at uh, satellites that measure the mass that's lost directly simply by the fact that gravity changes in the region where you lose a lot of mass. It's a bullseye directly over Thwaites Glacier. Here's the elevation data. This is a more recent study, but it's the same kind of data that Duncan alluded to, um, showing that Thwaites is right in the middle of a broad area that's showing tremendous elevation change as this ice flows faster into the sea. What we've got now, though, is a situation where we've identified a couple of processes that could lead to a rapid increase in how fast a glacier flows into the ocean, and both of these are in play for Thwaites Glacier. A surface uh, melt and hydrofracture, a process where water seeps into cracks from the surface and forces them uh, open downward through the ice, cracking it off, breaking it into pieces, uh, that's an important process in parts of the peninsula of Antarctica, a much warmer climate right now. What we've learned uh, somewhat more recently is that ice-ocean interaction is also a major feature of what's going on along this coast. That's the current cause of the thinning and the mass loss that I have pointed to before. That also can accelerate greatly um, under future scenarios. This is a sort of a model, and we're going to talk a little bit about why we think this all hangs together as a, a process that could, in particular, influence Thwaites Glacier. What we've seen in recent years is a kind of deep, warm ocean layer. For the most part, it was always there, but only rarely did it get up onto the continental shelf below the floating parts of the ice. If it does that, because it's warm and dense, because it's got more salt in it, it reaches this area where the ice first goes afloat melts it uh, quite rapidly, actually tens of meters per year. Even a degree or two above freezing is a lot of energy for uh, the ocean to carry to the ice sheet and then flows out this way. What you see here are uh, examples of the kinds of processes we're going to study in terms of how the ice breaks off the front and what happens if the ice retreats to being a very tall uh, ice cliff facing the sea. Uh, atmospheric influences have been described in many papers talking about how warmer oceans are influencing uh, climate patterns uh, in the Pacific in particular and in a large area near Antarctica called the Amundsen Sea Low. And we'll also be investigating the ocean and the sediments here below. This uh, picture here really, I think, demonstrates why you care about Thwaites. If you're concerned about marine ice sheet instability, and what that means is as the ice retreats from this coastline, it retreats into thicker areas of ice and ice that's resting on deeper areas of bedrock. Well, take a look under Thwaites. There's the bedrock with the ice removed. and You can see that it reaches into the very deepest parts of the West Antarctic ice sheet and that there's a downward sloping bed uh, as you retreat away from the coastline. That's key because that leads to this faster and faster flow um, as the uh, thicker ice begins to squeeze itself out from the continent at high speed. The other process that we're really quite concerned about is whether or not these tall ice cliffs that are modeled and in fact are suspected to be uh, incipient on some of the Greenland glaciers uh, can actually undergo a very rapid kind of runaway calving, which we call marine ice cliff instability. That sort of process hasn't been seen yet in this part of Antarctica, might be present in some parts of the peninsula, but in particular around Greenland seems to be a path to a very rapid retreat of the ice front. And that's a problem. Um, what we've got here, though, is a, a puzzle, basically, of the eight projects. Um, set together with the Science Coordination Office, each of them taking on a different part of the uh, problem. Basically, we have some uh, field studies we illustrated by the tent and the traverses, uh, aircraft, and also modeling studies here that are going to attempt to use computers to integrate what we learn from the field to better forecast what's going to happen. 
the reason the science coordination office is in the middle is that we're, our focus is going to be both to integrate the results, try to maximize them, connect ideas and data from the different projects together, and also see to it that both the public and uh, the youthful public, the K-12 through education in the U.S., are informed about the results. Another look at how to break down the projects more geographically. Here's a close-up of the Thwaites Glacier Basin extending into the center of West Antarctica. We'll use this waste divide camp as a kind of staging and fueling area, but the different projects with the different acronyms are strewn out across both the ocean and the ice sheet uh, in the vicinity of Thwaites. These two gold-colored uh, projects, or maybe that's bronze, uh, are the two modeling studies that are going to focus on, first of all, forecasting what's going to happen to Thwaites, integrating the red dots, the field data that we'll gather. Domino is a project that will look more closely at what sort of processes occur at the front in terms of accelerated calving and how the ice comes off of the bed of the ice sheet of the uh, continent. Uh, Tarzan is a project that involves both ocean and land ice measurement, looking below floating ice to see how the ocean is circulating at the, right where the uh, ice first comes afloat. Melt has a very similar goal, looking at ocean circulation and that interface, which uh, is key for basically loosening the glacier from the continent right at the point where it comes afloat. THOR stands for Thwaites Offshore Research. That'll look a lot at sediments in the seabed and what sort of recent history we can discern from looking at those sediments. And then uh, geological history constraints. Basically, we'll look at some of the rock outcrops adjacent to Thwaites to see if these mountains are actually sentinels that have recorded past events, as well as recent uh, thinning or thickening of the ice sheet in Antarctica. This uh, project here, Time, is going to take a look at how the margin where the faster flowing ice here butts up against the slow moving ice against the side, how that is, um, process is unfolding over time. The margin on Thwaites is known to be actually widening. Part of the concern is that it's not only big now, it's getting bigger. And that's a, a, an issue for concern because if this entire front moves at the kinds of speeds that we've seen in the center of the ice front, we'll have a very great deal of mass flowing off of the con and into the ocean uh, indeed. So that's the previous diagram just illustrated with some of the instruments that we're hoping to set out on the ice. Um, quite a bit going on in the ocean because, as Duncan mentioned, the ocean has turned out to be the key for initiating this. But we're also going to be taking a look on the ice, both with weather stations and with devices that measure how fast the ice thins. Aircraft surveys of the area will continue to use remote sensing to evaluate what's happening on the ice on a broader scale. And traverses to uh, measure the ice in profile with various radiation and uh, seismic instruments that, that uh, bounce waves through the ice and the ocean layer. Um, and we'll be using these uh, uh, automated undersea vehicles to explore this cavity. One of the most truly remote, remote regions on Earth is beneath an ice shelf uh, on the perimeter of Antarctica, a very difficult place to explore. That sort of positions the projects in a conceptual scale as to where they'll be focused on the sediments, uh, modeling both uh, the entire basin and the ice front in particular, both Melt and Tarzan concerned with this column, basically, and in particular, maybe that might have been the better spot to put it. Time and Ghost. Ghost will actually take a look at the uh, sediments beneath the ice and what the condition is where the ice meets the continent uh, in terms of uh, freeze, thaw, loose sediments, hard bedrock, and uh, the nature of the ice above it. Uh, time, as I mentioned, will be looking sort of at the margin where the ice flows past uh, stationary ice adjacent to it. So, <clears throat> of course, the main product of funded science is going to be the data, the things that we learn. And what we need to do is uh, take a look at how to integrate those different data sets. Uh, first of all, tell each other and the world about them through what's called metadata, which means information about the different data sets that we gather. Um, how many kilometers, how many uh, cores, how many samples. And then also share that data across the groups, and in particular with some of the early career scientists because they're on a short time scale. They can't uh, uh, afford to wait until the data is formally published at the end of the study. So we'll try to do that. 
uh, within the team and make sure that we've got a robust um, uh, culture of uh, collaboration built uh, for the uh, ITGC as we go forward. On broader impacts, each proposal uh, suggested that they would do some amazing things in terms of telling the public about what they're intending to do. K through 12 education, museum presentations, uh, major media outlets entrained in the research and in some cases coming out there with us to the ice or on the ships. Those things, the SCO's job will be to try to link them together and maximize uh, the public's awareness of what's going on in the field by putting together the K through 12 projects or the museum presentation so that we have better ones that are shared across more of the public in both nations. So in summary, Wythe Waits, no glacier really is more susceptible to these two processes that I identified, marine ice sheet instability, where the ice retreats into a deeper bed, marine ice cliff instability, where the tall cliff that might form at the front of the glacier begins to calve, begins to break apart in a runaway fashion. And what's more is no glacier threatens the center of West Antarctica uh, more directly than Thwaites. And uh, there's our flag picture, a great collaboration among nations. Um, and uh, I, I think the UK flag is in that circle around the South Pole. Huh. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, how we are actually going to deliver this science and what's going on behind the scenes now that the scientific projects have been selected to actually get them to where they need to be. This is, I think, the Carlsberg program. It's possibly the most ambitious pro field program that's ever been undertaken in Antarctica. I keep saying that and nobody's challenged me. But certainly in terms of the numbers attached to this project, it's the biggest thing that I've seen in 30 years of scientific uh, work in Antarctica. We are talking about 45,000 pounds, 200 tonnes of scientific cargo going into one of the most remote parts of Antarctica. We're talking about deploying over three seasons. These are the two big field seasons. 80, 55 scientists into the field plus the support staff um, they need. We're talking about five separate tractor um, traverse uh, capabilities, in total traveling about 30,000 kilometers over the ice and towing about 450 tons of scientific cargo and fuel. This is a really big program. Um, we, even UK and US, can't deliver all of that ourselves. And we have some partners coming on board at the moment. Their role, these other countries, the institutions within them, will likely become more prominent as we work through the field planning and they become more and more engaged. I've likened this to the fact that the funding from the National Science Foundation and the Natural Environment Research Council has allowed us to set this train, logistics train, in forward motion towards Thwaites Glacier. As we are progressing towards it, I feel there's a strong likelihood that other nations will add to that, bring a carriage of their own to add to the train and increase this effort in future. Both the UK and the US are completely committed to safe operations in Antarctica. This is a professional um, uh, logistics operation. We are not and don't consider ourselves to be expeditioners. We're there very much to do a job of work, which is to bring home that data that Dave, Ted has described to you. This is why this is difficult. This is why nobody's done this work before. Those two stations, Rothera for the UK and McMurdo for the US, are essentially the closest stations to Thwaites Glacier in the middle. There are no other nations active in that sector of Antarctica, and uh, it is almost equidistant from our stations. What are we going to use? Our assets are, that we're bringing to bear on this are enormous. A fleet of red ships, um, US, Nathaniel B. Palmer, the Korean vessel, the Ariane, um, HMS Protector, 
and the Sir David Attenborough in the out years, uh, the later years of the program. Sir David Attenborough has not yet actually been put in the water, but this will be one of its first major scientific challenges um, in 2021, if I'm correct on there. I'm looking for a nod from Mike Din, and he's given it. So 2021, Sir David Attenborough will be there. We have aircraft, Bass and uh, Ken Borick, twin otters, will be doing logistic role and also survey, uh, geophysical survey. The Air National Guard's heavy lift capability out of McMurdo will be delivering food, fuel scientists into the field. Twin, uh, the Ken Borick Basler is a slightly intermediate kind of aircraft. And then we have helicopters. Uh, from our Korean partners will be doing radar survey with this strange instrument that hangs underneath their instruments. Um, others may become available. We are of course still putting people into the field, scientists and support staff into probably two camps, Waste Divide Camp and another camp further downstream that has not yet been established. People will have to live in tough conditions. I've been to Pine Island Glacier and the weather there, this photograph at the bottom right, can be pretty severe. We're going to be pushing the field season to the edge of the time that we normally work in Antarctica to make uh, the most of the opportunity. And we're going to be using new uh, facilities like tractor traverses to actually move people around on the ice. These are the diagrams that come out of our logistics planning at the moment. I'm going to show you three, each for the three main years that we're going to be working. The major movements of the ships and the aircraft and the over snow traverses. Truly, all I want you to see here is the level of complexity in the operation and the level of detail in the planning that is already going on to deliver these, even three field seasons into the future. So that one shows deployment from bottom right, McMurdo, top left, Rothera, and through the ocean uh, with variety of ships. The second year is even more complex and has even more field sites to visit. And the third year is the, uh, with a big focus on the marine, uh, with the state of Attenborough going in from the ocean but still big field parties being deployed onto Thwaites Glacier as low down the glacier as can be got uh, without getting involved in the karate. Ted, instrumentation. Yeah, each of the projects is also proposed to do quite a lot in uh, the way of using the most advanced instruments that they might be able to get as ways of extending the field project to other times of the year or to other areas that simply can't be reached by people. Um, we'll, be, whoops, we'll be using the uh, automatic underwater vehicles. And in fact, uh, we've secured a couple that have fairly long range. They're capable of independent operation beneath the floating ice, the thick floating ice at the front of the glacier. The AP Res, which is a phase sensitive radio echo sounder, sounds complicated. It's actually uh, quite a simple instrument to install, and yet it has the capability of measuring thinning rates at levels of centimeters per day. And so installing a network of these over some of the areas of the floating ice will tell us exactly where things are changing. We'll use advanced seismic and radar methods that are intended to understand the ice fabric. That's how the crystals are actually oriented within the ice. These things affect how radar or radio waves penetrate the ice or sound waves penetrate the ice. We'll also um, oh, include the vibrosize, which is basically a large truck that's capable of shaking the earth and shaking the earth in a very precise way, as actually a signature way. And then you listen for that signature at various amplitudes to return to the geophones and tell you what just happened underneath the ice or in the rock below. Uh, the automated uh, surface stations, there's several different types. I'm actually mostly involved with this one called Amigos. That's not the acronym. This is Advanced Meteorology, Ice, and Geophysics Observing Station. But there's several different versions of these things. As simple as automated weather stations, which people see driving down the road sometimes, every day. And then um, 
What we're trying to do with these things are measure additional properties of the ice and the environment in the places that we visit, but have them tell us what's going on in the months that we're not there, uh, through the winter and even for years after the main field season is over with. And on modeling, we have two major studies funded, as I alluded to before. Um, they're going to be exploring new physics for calving and ice flow and also integrating the observations that we gather uh, to try to um, uh, extend what we can do with ocean ice atmosphere coupled models. And by coupled models, that simply means that if you understand the ocean and you uh, include code that describes how the ocean might influence the ice, then you also have a model of the ice that is allowed to respond to that and change the ocean by melting and freshening the water at the same time, and similar kinds of linkages for the atmosphere and those other two systems. I put this in red because that's really the holy grail. What we want to do is improve our ability to forecast what's going to happen to this glacier. And on a very short time scale, doing this at the decadal scale, having better forecasting at that scale, is a real challenge because if you are allowed to talk about thousands of years, then we can say in broad brush strokes what's going to happen. But the thing that's most valuable to decision makers is that short term decadal scale, century scale forecasting that allows people to actually plan on how to protect their coastline or the infrastructure. I'm going to do this or not. Either way. Okay. It says TS, but. So that concludes, um, that concludes the presentations, and we can now start um, our Q&A. Mary, if I could have your heart with you. Yes, at this point, can I ask all the PIs to join us at the front? Yes, please get your hands up. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to Okay, so let oh gosh, I sound really loud. Sorry for that. Um, we're going to start with the Q and A. Um, shall we start with people in the room? We've already had some some questions um, emailed to us. Now, whoever is going to answer, I'm going. Please wait until you get a microphone. And if you'd like to introduce who you are and what project you're working on, that would be really helpful. So, shall we start with people in the room? David David Shukman from BBC News. Hi, David Shrookman, BBC News. I mean, c compared to other field work that you guys have done in other bits of Antarctica or Greenland or wherever, how much more challenging will this be because of its remoteness? Okay. I am Andy Smith, uh, glaciologist at the British Antarctic Survey. For, for uh, us, in my experience, this is huge. This is a bigger scale than, uh, than we ever tried to do before. Um, the science is really ambitious, but just the, simply the location and getting there and doing the, the work, it's, a, it's a, another scale up from certainly what I've experienced in the past. Um, weather conditions and technical uh, issues, um, they certainly won't be any easier than any other experiences we've had. Notoriously, this, this, this region can be difficult to get to and um, poor weather uh, and with being a long way from anywhere we don't have much backup if anything goes wrong. Okay, any other questions from the room? Uh, so oh, it's Jonathan on. Amos, uh, David Sidekick here, uh, if that's all right. Um, could I actually address a question to Duncan Wingham? first of all, if that's possible, Chief Executive of, of NERC. And, and the question I've got is, um, is this additional money, or are you having to take this money out of the NERC budget from somewhere else? 
Uh, I suppose the answer to that question is neither. Um, NERC has a budget. It's of the order of £300 million a year. And we operate that budget to allow a situation where we commit to new programmes every year because other programmes uh, come to a, an end. And our job is, broadly speaking, to try and decide which are most important new projects that we should fund. Um, I think for the reasons that you've heard, it was not difficult for us to make the decision that this, this project deserved uh, our, our funding and that because all other projects had come to an end, this deserved it. So, so in a sense, uh, Jonathan, it's, it's neither that we're cancelling anything nor that um, this is uh, new funding. It is just part of the funding that we are responsible for and which we, we direct at the most deserving projects. Uh, okay, and then can we um, talk about uh, some of the papers that appeared in 2014. Um, the Jorkin paper, the Reno paper, Hilmar uh, Goodmanson I see here has uh, uh, also had a paper I think in 14 looking at uh, the possibility of, of runaway uh, retreat of these glaciers of pig uh, of Thwait. So what is, the, what is the thinking about whether we are actually into a runaway retreat now uh, or is it going to take something else to, to get us into that situation? I don't know if Hilmar has a has a, has a view on that. <coughs> Question now. Yeah, I, th I think this is indeed the biggest question. Um, and it's, it's absolutely fascinating because there's a chance there that both Pine Island Glacier and Thwaites are just inherently unstable. Um, the word stability is used quite frequently, but and maybe sometimes too frequently. But here, I, th I think it's really justified. Um, so the studies that you uh, mentioned there, um, I think, Matthew, you were on some of those as well. No new one, but none these. Um, but there have been several studies which have all concluded that um, Pine Island Glacier can enter unstable retreat mode. And if you look at the weights, that seems to be even more likely. Um, however, the, the, um, the devil is in the detail because we know, also know that there are various ways of stopping that retreat. Um, Pinning points that stabilize the grounding line, margins that suppress this uh, so-called marine ice sheet instability. So while it seems quite possible, we don't know for sure. And that's going to be one of the very exciting outcomes of this project. Yeah, thank you. It's Leo Hickman from the Carbon Brief website. Um, a question about, um, so obviously the, the, the broad focus is the stability of the glacier, but is there is there sort of secondary research that might come out of this? Really, I, I'm, I heard early on there was mention of the impact it might have on ocean circulation um, in that region, but is there kind of wildlife research, et cetera, et cetera? Is it very, very tightly focused on the the stability, getting data together for the stability of the glacier? Um, I'll answer that first, and then if anybody else wants to butt in. This is about ice and sea level and its impact on the oceans. And you're right, I think, to pick out that particular area of ocean circulation where the output from this program will definitely feed into the oceanographic models of the global circulation. and We may eventually see a, a, a change in impact. It's not at the moment about wildlife. Um, we are enlisting some wildlife seals in particular to help us in our task. And they will be uh, kitted out with some sensors that help us understand the ocean um, system. And actually we will learn things about those species and their life cycles that, that may help them in future. Um, but it's not primarily about the wildlife. This is about the ice and the oceans. Does anybody want to add anything? Karen Hayward? Thank you. Karen Hayward, University of East Anglia. So uh, David was absolutely right. We are going to be uh, instrumenting SEALs, and uh, one of the advantages that that's going to give us is observations in the winter time. It's going to give us uh, an understanding of the seals' environment. So we're not exploiting the seals, 
but we'll understand what the changes that we're all going to be looking at, uh, how that will affect uh, the, the seals environment. The other thing that uh, is closely linked with the work that a lot of us are doing is that the, uh, the melting of the glaciers sometimes can bring uh, nutrients into the ocean and that can stimulate productivity which can impact uh, on the carbon cycling. So although most of us around this table are interested in the, the sea level issues, there are certainly going to be huge benefits for uh, biogeochemists, uh, for ecologists and, uh, and other disciplines in understanding the multidisciplinary uh, environment there. Uh, Robert McSweeney, also from Carbonbury. Um, it'd be interesting to hear a bit more about the projects that are on the ice specifically. Um, what sort of things will they be measuring? Um, and have scientists been on the ice before? This is Sridhar Anand Krishnan from Penn State University. Uh, so I'm at the GOES project, which is one of uh, two or three projects which will be directly on the ice. And GOES stands for Geophysical uh, Habitat of Subglacial Thwaites. So the, the, the primary purpose of our project is to understand the interface between the ice and the rock or sediment beneath. Uh, because uh, much modeling, including what Hilmar referred to earlier, really uh, points to that interface as critical uh, to the stability or the re retreat rate of Thwaites Glacier. And uh, again, as he said, the devil's in the details, uh, the distribution of soft or wet sediments versus hard bedrock, uh, the uh, uh, places where it's thawed and there are lakes, all those things really matter. And the modeling suggests that the glacier could be stable under some conditions or it could retreat rapidly under other conditions of the bed. Um, I've been on Thwaites Glacier, this is going to the question that was asked earlier, and the scale of the work that's needed uh, to answer this is enormous. In my three seasons on Thwaites Glacier, we got a tiny little piece of it uh, after, uh, over, after enormous effort from NSF. <laughs> <laughs> Not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I think that it, the on-ice projects are really going to focus on understanding the margin, and maybe Slavic and others can speak about that. And what we're going to try and do is look at that basal interface. Hi, Joe Johnson from British Antarctic Survey. Um, so I've worked in the area before on two previous field campaigns, and what I was doing was looking back in the past, so looking at um, rock surfaces above the ice sheet surface and dating those to see when they were co last covered by ice. And the project that I'm working on as part of this um, collaboration um, will build on that work, and what we're planning to do is to drill down through the modern ice, well, the, through the surface into the bedrock that's actually below the ice sheet surface. What we want to do is to look back in the past to see if there is evidence for um, retreat of the ice um, and then subsequent re-advance. And if, that, if we can show evidence that that has happened over, say, the last few thousand years when the climate has been similar to that today, then that might suggest that the current retreat is reversible. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, any other questions from the floor? Otherwise, I've got one by email. John, um, hang on, Mary, just give you a uh, Can you just talk about how Boaty is going to be used? <laughs> Sorry, say again. So, so, Boaty. Boaty at boat face. Boaty I think that's, a, that's an answer for Karen. <laughs> yes, so uh, Karen Hayward, University of East Anglia again. So uh, our Tarzan project is going to send uh, Autosub Long Range, also known as Boatim at Boatface, uh, underneath the uh, Thwaites uh, Glacier, uh, and another one, possibly uh, Dotson, and uh, to try to understand what's happening beneath the ice, the, the, in the ocean uh, underneath the ice shelf. Uh, and 
what we hope to do in our project is link the atmosphere, the ocean and the ice all together. So Boti will be venturing into the cavity and we hope she will come back. <laughs> <laughs> we, we also, I, it's not kind of part of the question, but we also have a University of Gothenburg uh, similar um, autonomous underwater vehicle. So we think we'll be the first project to send two AUVs together to venture under the ice. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had a, a question by email from Alex Kirby from Climate News Network. Um, has the initiative come from the UK or the US? Why has it come now, given what the science is saying about Thwaites? And does this indicate that the decision to mount this program is a response to an emergency? So who would like to answer that? Um, Toby, do you have to stand? Okay. Um, was this initiative, did it come from the UK or the US? Squarely and very honestly, actually, this came from both sides of the pond. And this initiative has grown out of both meetings that were led and discussions that were led by US colleagues around the National Academies of Sciences uh, uh, report and then a meeting in the Royal Society that I and colleagues... Andy Smith led from the UK side. So very much this is a joint collaboration, not only in its execution, but also in, in its inception and its thought. Um, the second question was, why has it come now and what is the science saying about Thwaites? Really, now is the perfect opportunity to take this science forward um, not only from the science perspective, but actually also from the, we have the logistic capacity to put people where we need to go through this collaboration in a way I don't think we've seen in the past. Um, and then there was the third question, does this indicate a response to an emergency? I think that understanding future sea level rise and the risk that it poses to coastal communities, ecosystems around the world um, is the front line of climate change and is going to be one of the most obvious and immediate it's, it's test. Don't impact of um, climate change in a global sense that we're going to see in the future. And it's one where uniquely we can do something um, really to help policymakers out, whether that be on a national or a local or an international scale, to prepare for the future by having better projections of sea level rise. Is this an emergency? Well, sea level doesn't rise overnight. It's always a progressive thing that goes year by year by year. But sea level is rising at about 3.2 millimetres per year. And it's not showing any signs of decreasing. And we can only see increase uh, over the next century. So is it an emergency? Well, it's not an emergency this year, but I'm very pleased that we're doing it this decade because we can't wait too long. Sorry, I don't know if anybody else wants to add to that. Anyone else have anything to add? No? Okay, we have a question uh, from the Daily Telegraph then. Uh, from Henry Bodkin, what does the science tell us about the threat to the UK coastline and inland areas posed by one metre and three metres of sea level rise, i.e. how much land could be lost or threatened? I'm looking around, I'm looking around the semicircle. Does anybody want to take that? Are you going to make me do... Let me start on that one and see if anybody wants to pick it up. Um, in a way, sea level rise is, affects us by changing the frequency with which we get storm surges that damage our coastlines. And it, it, it's almost a bit of a red herring to look for new areas of the coastline that are threatened um, by sea level rise, certainly for the first metre. It's essentially going to be the same coastline, but it is going to be more frequently damaged by storm surges, and those storm surges will have a greater impact on that coastline. Eventually, if we look out beyond the 100 years and the possible metre, 
possible metre and a half that we might get in that period, then we might start to see changes in the shape of our coastline and parts of our uh, low-lying coastal environments that are lost to the sea. But really, if we wait for that to happen, we will have missed the main point, which is how sea level rise increases that frequency and impact of storm surges on the existing coastline. Does anybody want to add to that? Good. Okay. (laughs) I hope I answered the question. Okay, thank you, David. Um, We've also got a question from Carolyn Beeler from the BBC, who is based in the US. Um, How many individuals or research groups have ever been on Thwaites Glacier to do research before? Can we provide some context on what kind of on-the-ice and underwater data has been gathered previously on Thwaites? So Thwaites Glacier was uh, first studied during the uh, International Geophysical Year, the International Polar Year, 1957-58, when uh, uh, I think at that time mainly U.S. researchers working out of Bird Surface Camp did traverses across what is now Thwaites Glacier. Uh, It fell out of... um, interest mainly because of logistical reasons. It is so far away, it is so difficult to get to, and the weather uh, is notoriously bad. And it was only, once again, perhaps uh, 10 to 12 years ago uh, that research uh, on the ground started to focus there. As Duncan pointed out, perhaps two decades ago, uh, satellite research uh, uh, and airborne research was done over that area. But on the ground, it was only about 10 years ago that uh, people started to creep back onto Thwaites Glacier. Um, I know of perhaps uh, uh, three or four groups that have done work there, people putting out seismometers as part of the PolNet project, and then some oversnow uh, seismic and radar traverses that, was done, that were done by different groups, including myself, uh, and then some preliminary drilling work to look at, uh, looking, at looking at the um, accumulation rates uh, over the recent decades to, to century. So I think it's been a progressive um, uh, uh, accumulation of data going from the satellite work to the ground-based work, and then now we're putting it all together with the oceans coming on and the, the, the geological history coming on uh, to, to try and, and, and really project forward what the sea level impacts will be. Okay. Great, if we could pass the microphone to Rob Larter. It's like Chinese whispers. Okay, I'm Rob Larter from the British Antarctic Survey. I, I'd like to add to what Sridhar said from the marine side. I've, I've been into the Amundsen Sea in the general area of Thwaites Glacier on three research cruises. To my knowledge, there were no real research cruises in the area before the early 1990s and the first cruise there uh, revealed, an oceanographic cruise, uh, revealed some quite uh, amazing and alarming results about the rate of melt going on on the ice shelves. Um, There were cruises subsequent to that every few years, but, and I think in the last few years there's been a research ship, one or more research ships there almost every year, Uh, but it's still a very difficult place to work. Sometimes you can't get to the, the research area you'd like to work in because of the, the, the sea ice, which is very variable from year to year. Uh, I think if anybody had been trying to do some of the marine work we want to do in the last season, they would have had a, an incredibly hard time. So uh, we have to hope for good conditions, and it, it's certainly one of the reasons, one of the, the reasons behind the, the project that uh, Julia and I are working on, why we... We, we've really strongly pushed to have uh, two chances to get there. Thanks very much, Rob. Okay, we have one last question from Carolyn Beeler, which is, in terms of future sea level rise, can you describe both a best case and worst case scenario for what you expect to find? A minimum and maximum amount of sea level rise you expect weights might contribute to sea level rise? Drew, that's a tough one. Um, uh, the, let's let's talk about 
full sea level rise rather than specifically talking about Thwaites. And, um, I think the lowest estimate that I personally um, uh, would suggest is that we continue the current rate of sea level rise. And this, the very lowest estimate that I can imagine by 2100 is around 30 centimetres of sea level rise above to year 2000 state. And that is just a continuance of what we already know is happening uh, to the oceans through ice loss and thermal expansion of the oceans. The mid-range estimate is certainly double that um, and might be looking towards the you know, 70 centimetres. But we undoubtedly could get a metre of sea level rise or perhaps even more. Um, we might actually look around the room here and we could look and say how much do people actually believe sea level might be earth weights might contribute and push that number up so I, I certainly would does anybody think that the upper estimate should be lower than one meter okay so let's say one meter between one meter and one and a half meters <laughs> There's a few hands. What period of time? By 2100. So by 2100, would anybody suggest it was closer to two meters? Was the upper likely maximum? We've got a couple there who actually think that two meters. Any any advance on two meters? <laughs> I mean, I, we're throwing these numbers around a little bit glibly, and I'm, I'm not actually. Um, trying to inject any humour here because these are really serious numbers and it is undoubted that if we get the higher range towards let's say a metre and a half by 2100 then the impacts on coastal communities and around the world are going to be very severe but we are looking at black swan events and we are being asked by the policy makers to really understand those black swan events where multiple things Climate change, uh, carbon emissions are high, climate change is high, the impact on the ice sheets is high, and lots of things stack up. So this is one of the reasons why this whole problem is actually very difficult, is we're being asked to look into the future that is uncertain and is not simply a perturbation of the world that we have at the moment, but is actually moving this ice sheet into a very different state that may actually be uh, dramatic. And on that note, oh, no, sorry, Robert. Can I, can I just add some context to what David's talking about there? Uh, there is some very interesting evidence from the geological record about how fast sea level can rise, what are the speed limits of sea level rise, and that is during the retreat of the Great Ice Sheets after the last glacial maximum, there was a brief period about 14,000 years ago where the best evidence suggests sea level rose by about 17 metres in 350 years. So that, that's a rate of four or five metres per century. Nobody actually really understands how that happened, where all that water came from, but it, it, it is really a, a sobering thought about just how fast sea level can potentially rise. On that note, unless the... Oh, no, one last... <laughs> Paul Christopherson. Yeah, just, just one last note. Paul Christopherson from the Scott Polar Research Institute. I, I just think... I'd like to clarify that the reason that we are sitting here a little bit on the fence is we, we don't actually have the observations that are needed to constrain and answer that question uh, in an accurate way. And a program like this is what we need to allow us to do that better. So the computer models that these predictions rely on do not include at this point in time the processes and dynamics and glaciological aspects that they need to do to answer the question. So it's all hypothetical or, or, or to a large, large extent hypothetical what this is going to be and that's why we're sitting here not quite sure what to, what to say we could easily be over one meter but there's also processes and dynamics that could do the opposite and that's why we're very excited to do uh, and be involved in this project well if we knew the answers we wouldn't have this program mm -hmm. so i guess if we have the same questions in five years time we will have some 
some answers and, and, and know the figures better. So on that note, I'll conclude this uh, press conference. For anybody who's joined us um, to the live stream, this presentation has been recorded and will be available later in the day, as will the slides from the presentations. So thank you very much for joining us today. Please, for those of you in the room, please go and have some lunch. Um, and there are a few interviews uh, scheduled as well. So thank you very much for your time. Science is between here and getting a number that's more than a million. Thank you.